Lord Ashdown, Paddy Ashdown, as, as you all well know, uh, is uh, one of the best known British politicians of his time and continues today to be very active in, in all manner of debates in the UK. He's a member of the, of the House of Lords, but before all of that, he started by studying Mandarin in Hong Kong in the 60s. He took part in Hong Kong demonstrations here uh, during the spring of 1989, was active in a call for British passport holders in Hong Kong to have right of abode, and then, of course, uh, Traveller Journey Through UK Politics, Leader of Liberal Democrats, uh, served a key UN posting in the Balkans, uh, served for the UK military and of course is now um, a member of the House of Lords. Paddy today is going to talk about China's rise and what it means for world peace. As we all know, the big question of our time is how will the United States cope with its own decline and how can China fulfil its potential as a superpower as new, rise, as new powers rise and old powers fall? Paddy is very keen to have some questions at the end of this, so please do think of some questions and uh, we leave plenty of time for discussion. So could you all please give a warm welcome to Lord Ashdown and Paddy Ashdown. Thank you. Well, Edna, thank you very much in particular for conceding to my wish of keeping the introduction short. I said to him that you know, people sort of lavish themselves, luxuriate, in, in back history so that I feel at the end of it that I have to not so much stand up and speak as swing through on a rope with a, my, my face blacker than a dagger in my teeth. Um, uh, but it's great to have an introduction. By the way, I, I discovered that in the, in the old days when I was a little bit better known, um, people used to stand up and say things like, and now someone who needs no introduction. Um, isn't true particularly any longer. I was walking through Waterloo Station not very long ago, a little man came up to me and said, here, he said, here, didn't you used to be Paddy Ashdown? <laughs> so the fact that you've invited me here today seems to prove that I still am, and that's jolly reassuring for me, even if it's not for you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back. I wanted to come here um, just about now because of after recent events, but it lets you into a little secret. Um, we designed my trip in which I'll be seeing all the main politicians and most of them, not all of the government people, um, around this speech. The moment that you said you could have me here um, was when I decided I would come. Not just because I have many happy memories, um, usually very late night ones around the bar of the FCC in my days here in the mid-1960s. And it's wonderful to see the old building still here and largely unchanged. So, thank you for inviting me. And Ender's right about what I want to talk about. Peace, it seems to me, in the Pacific region and very probably in the wider world will, I think, now depend on two key questions. How will the United States cope with the fact that it will no longer be the singular colossus that bestrides the world? And how will China fulfill her potential as a superpower? Not long after I returned from Bosnia in 2006 at the end of my term as High Re Representative, uh, that was in the middle of the era of small wars. I was asked, by the way, by a journalist, if great wars were now a thing of the past. I replied, no. Unhappily, the habit of war, large and small, seems hardwired into the human gene and especially perhaps the male human gene. But I did not believe, I said, that once we were past the fossil fuel area, that the most likely place for a great conflagration would be in the Middle East. If we wanted to see where future great wars might occur, we should look to those regions where mercantilism was leading to an increase in nationalist sentiment and imperialist attitudes, as indeed it did in Europe in the 19th century. The only region in the world, I concluded, which matched this description was the Pacific Basin. Nothing I have seen in the intervening years, de de in the intervening decade, alters that basic judgment. We live, I think, in one of those periods of history where the structures of world power and the balance of world powers are shifting. And these are almost always turbulent times and all too often conflict-ridden ones too. How new powers rise and old powers fall is one of the prime determinants of peace in times such as we have now. The Pacific Basin, it seems to me, is about to be the cockpit in which this drama 
over the next few decades is likely to be played out. The United States is the most powerful nation on earth and, in my view, is likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. But the context in which she holds that power is completely different from what it was. Over the last hundred years or so, the American century it's come to be known as, we've lived in a monopolar world dominated by the American colossus. By the way, this is not a normal shape for international affairs. Probably only three times in history has it occurred before, once at the end of the Roman Empire, once arguably at the end of the British Empire, and the last 50 or 100 years that we have seen. But that factor, that fact of a monopolar world, is no longer true. We now live in a multipolar world, by the way, much more the normal course of events. And, by the way, very similar to 19th century Europe, where balance amongst the five powers, the so-called concert of Europe, meant peace, and imbalance meant war. We have seen this before. The end of the European empires after the Second World War led to great instability and much conflict, not least in this region. Britain, by and large, with some exceptions. Uh, I was a soldier in one of the last small wars of empire. Britain, by and large, accepted her decline and mostly, with some exceptions, dealt with it in a measured and civilized fashion. We'll come on to what that means for Hong Kong in a moment. France, and forgive me, my French friends, I'm going to be a little bit straightforward and perhaps a little rude. France, by contrast, lashed about, soaking first Indochina and then North Africa in blood. And the Belgians were, as we remember and still see today, the consequences of it even worse in the Belgian Com Congo. How the United States copes with her relative decline from the world's only superpower to primus inter pares in a multipolar world is one of the great questions which will decide what happens in this region and perhaps wider than this region in the next decade. President Trump seemed to understand this. Sorry, I beg your pardon. President Obama. <laughs> there is a difference. President Obama seemed to understand this. President Trump, it seems, does not. His policies of isolationism, protectionism, and confrontation towards China are foolish and dangerous. Foolish because he is abandoning American leadership of the multilateral space, and that will not strengthen America, as he suggests, but hasten her decline. Dangerous because US isolationism will weaken multilateral instruments, which are the only means of resolving conflict and tackling global problems such as climate change. China's position as a mercantile superpower, it seems to me, is now already largely established. It was inevitable that she would now seek to consolidate her trading strength by becoming, or seeking to become, a political and military superpower too. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a perfectly natural ambition. It's the way superpowers behave. It's indeed the way they have to behave to protect their position. And this, therefore, should not in and of itself be a matter of alarm or criticism. It is natural, too, and good, that China should seek to fill the vacuum of leadership in regional and global multilateral institutions left by Trump's foolish retreat from this space far better for us all, it seems to me, to have an engaged China than an isolated one. The last great strategic opportunity faced by the West was the fall of the Soviet Union. We should then have reached out to engage Russia, to draw her in, to help her rebuild and reform. Instead, we foolishly treated Moscow with triumphalism and humiliation orchestrated largely by Washington. The result was inevitable, and he's called Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. We are now faced, it seems to me, with a second equivalent strategic choice. Can we reach out to build constructive relationships with a rising China? On the face of it, I would argue, the signs have been quite hopeful. China has seemed keen to be a good world citizen. She has engaged constructively in multilateral institutions. Look at the World Trade Organization as an example. Look at her support for the UN Security Council resolution on sanctions on North Korea. Look at her engagement with international forces to fight the scourge of Somali pirates around the Horn of Africa. Look at her particip participation 
in international disaster relief, for instance, in northeast Pakistan. Look at her involvement, if you will, although it's far too infrequently recognized. Look at her involvement with UN multilateral peacekeeping, to which she has committed, let me remind you, more troops under multinational UN command than the United States and Europe combined. Yes, of course, they are mostly in Africa, where she has good reason to want to keep the peace, but there's nothing new in that. Western nations, too, only send troops to, the peace, uh, to keep the peace where it is in their interest to do so. Almost all the signs we have seen over the last two decades seems to indicate that China sees it as in her mercantilist interest to have a more rule-based world order, perhaps not one based on the kind of rules we'd want, but nevertheless a more rule-based world order, and that's something which we in the West should agree with, too. It looked as though, it looked as though, there could be much which is constructive to work on here. Domestically, too, the movement in China seemed to be in a hopeful, broad direction. The Deng Xiaoping-initiated process of economic liberalization has been, I think we all agree, awe-inspiring to watch. Many of us have taken comfort in what we saw as the inevitable fact that economic liberalization must, over time, we thought, lead to some form of political liberalization as well. Anyone who understands China and Chinese history understands that this could not be too hasty, understands why Beijing is nervous about loosening the bonds too quickly, but the direction of travel seemed to be clear. After modernizing her, econ her economy, China would, over time, modernize her political and governmental structure in favor of greater democracy, albeit democracy with a Chinese face rather than the Western one. It was comfortable for those of us who observe and have an affection for China to believe that in a world almost overwhelmed by conflict, fracture, and repression, China would, we hoped, continue steadily moving in the opposite direction, steadily using her power for stability against turbulence and for partnership rather than raw power and going it alone. We even imagined that in her ascent to greatness, China might choose a tragically different from that followed by previous superpowers using her strength to lead internationally rather than succumbing to imperialist ambition. I do not think China's true long-term interest lies in responding to Donald Trump's invitation to a dogfight, albeit one which appears to have been postponed after Mr. Trump's effusive glad handing with Chairman Xi. China's interest lies rather, I would argue, in continuing to build her reputation as a good world citizen and in creating widespread alliances, leading them, if you like, in favor of the kind of rule-based world order which would benefit both her and us. Does that sound naive? Well, in truth, perhaps. Yet it remains the only hope for avoiding what will otherwise, I fear, be an inevitable long-term progress towards some kind of Pacific confrontation between a declining old power and a rising new one. But, naive or not, if these were our hopes, they have now come up against a jolting reality. Judging from the iconography of the recent People's Congress, it's difficult not to conclude that what we were looking at was less the emergence of a new China as the return of the old. A red emperor, centralized power, suppression, suppression of dissent, these were all perhaps necessary for Mao Zedong, who had to build a unified state from, yeah, from ashes and a nation which was rejected abroad after a century of humiliation. But the respect in which China is held abroad is not in question today, nor is her unity and strength. To return to the ways of Mao sits uncomfortably with China's ambition to be a modern state, and in my view can only serve to diminish her reputation abroad. As for unity, well, I know of no instance in history where the sustainable greatness of a nation has been built on a market that is free and a public voice that is suppressed. It is just not in human nature whether Chinese or otherwise, to be content for long with glorious freedom in one aspect of your life and permanent voicelessness in the other. It is sad, no more, it's worrying to note 
the recent rise in the curtailment of freedoms in the name of national security, the arrest of foreign NGO workers for expressing unwelcome views, the rising number of detentions of human rights activists, including, as we know, even lawyers. All this sits strangely and uncomfortably with promises to develop, and I quote, advanced, extensive, multi-level, institutionalized, consultative democracy and enhanced China's soft power to quote a phrase from the 3,000 word amendment incorporating Xi Jinping's socialism with Chinese characteristics, which was unanimously passed on the recent conference, uh, Congress. I do not believe that the Chinese people yearn for individual freedom and human rights any less than anyone else. A state whose economy pioneers the future, but whose politics has reverted to the past, is a state founded on a contradiction. Maybe I've read the signs wrong. Foreigners, even those who studied China for a long time, can easily do that. The proof of the pudding will come in the eating, as we say in English, one way were, as the Chinese would put it. And the first slices of that pudding will be eaten, maybe already have been eaten, here in Hong Kong. It is here, perhaps more than anywhere else, where we'll come to know the true nature of Xi Jinping's vision of socialism with a Chinese face. At this stage, I think I need to do a little bit of a mea culpa. When Beijing says there is a degree of hypocrisy beneath British calls for more democracy in Hong Kong, they are right. A hundred and more years of rule of Hong Kong as a colony was, notable, was not notable in any way for its democratic reform. Learning Chinese here between 1967 and 70, a time of considerable public disturbance and bomb attacks, as some will remember, I did not find it easy to defend the British administration here, let alone be proud of it in terms of the moves that they took to establish a deep-rooted democratic culture and climate. Of course, we know that Zhou Enlai threatened to repossess the colony by force if Britain introduced universal suffrage, but is it unworthy to think that this Beijing prohibition on full democracy was not very inconvenient to a British administration which didn't have much enthusiasm for it anyway? It would have been possible, even within the constraints set by Joe, for the British to at least set a direction of travel for Hong Kong by taking small steps towards democracy, even if they couldn't take big one. Is it fanciful to suggest that if they had done this, the democratic culture in Hong Kong would have had time to develop into something deeper, more embedded, and more mature than we currently see. The legacy I think we left is not necessarily a happy one. Take a look at the functional constituencies which still exist and, in my view, tend to misshape Hong Kong democracy in a way that ought to be beginning by now, as was promised, to be unraveled. British rule in Hong Kong was economically hugely successful, but politically it wasn't, I think, shameful. Chris Patton tried to ensure that the last page of the history book covering British rule in Hong Kong would be different so that the legacy we left would be truer to our values than the record of our administration of the colony. Is there hypocrisy in that? Yes, some. But to do the right thing in the end, is better than not to do it at all. As Rousseau said, hypocrisy est l'hommage que la vie rend à la vertu. Hypocrisy is the vice that vice gives. Hypocrisy is the service that vice gives to virtue. Whatever the motives, however, the fact is that the patent democratic reforms were locked into China, the Anglo-Chinese International Treaty, which enables and protects the basic law. And the heart of that basic law is the rule of law itself. The Hong Kong judiciary is still intact and still independent. Is it coming under pressure? I've looked into that very carefully when I've been here, and honestly, I think the judiciary has not. If it has, it's certainly resisting it very well. I'm not sure I can be entirely certain that I can uh, state that happy conclusion in relation to other elements. I mean, the Ministry of Justice must be independent too. It seems to me that if the rule of law is to last here, it must not only be done in a nation, in a country like this, in a place like this, it must also, to gain confidence among the people, to be seen to be done. 
the abduction of Hong Kong booksellers into the mainlands simply for having published, book, published books critical of China's leaders undermines confidence both in the rule of law and in the principle of free speech. The right to protest within defined limits is part of that law. The right to due process by a judicial system independent of political interference is part of it too. The right to be free from the hazard of double jeopardy if you choose to break the law is widely regarded as a fundamental principle of justice worldwide. Of course it is the case that those who break the law should be judged. So ladies and gentlemen, whether it is wise for the full might and majesty of a global superpower to come down on three young enthusiastic student demonstrators, one of whom is a directly elected legislator who may have overstepped the limit, is I think a different matter. But even the judged have rights and these must be protected too. The effective, just, wise and legal administration of Hong Kong is not an easy matter for Beijing to deal with. One country, two systems is far easier as a slogan than it is to put into practice and I think we should appreciate that. Nevertheless, this is what Beijing has formally and by international treaty put its hand to. One country, two systems is the slogan under which Beijing may want to draw others back to the fold. Honoring scrupulously the Anglo-Chinese deal in both letter and spirit will enhance that possibility. Any perceived failure to do so will weaken it. Britain too has laid its hand to that treaty and as you will recall with some fanfare. At the time, the British Prime Minister, John Major, undertook that if there were any, I use his words precisely, if there were any suggestion of a breach of the, of the joint declaration, we would have a duty to pursue every legal and other means available to us. He went further. In words which would have reminded every Hong Konger of the famous declaration of President Kennedy that he would always stand by the endangered city of Berlin, the British Prime Minister promised that Hong Kong will never have to walk alone. This is not a promise that can be lightly laid aside because it proves inconvenient to a British government obsessed with finding trade deals because it wishes to be outside Europe. As Chris Patton has said, Britain risks selling its honor here. The new mood also places new responsibilities on the SAR government as well. If things are to move in a more regressive direction on the mainland, then the SAR government has an even greater duty to show that it will stand up and defend Hong Kong's special status and its core values. That it will be an effective voice piece for the genuine concerns of the people of Hong Kong. For example, over the co-location of the high-speed rail link. I've now been here for a couple of three days and I've watched Hong Kong for a long time and one of the things that I adore about this place, I adore it, is its rumbustiousness, its cockiness, its impudence, its can-do attitude. It's always been one of the most significant features of this extraordinary, unusual place. Am I wrong in detecting on this visit that Hong Kong seems to have lost some of its self-confidence, seems to be looking over its shoulder a bit? Am I wrong in thinking that? Is this really about one country, two systems? I mean, Hong Kong has lived under one country, two systems since the Taipans first came here. You spent 150 years in bed with the superpower, operating two sets of values, and you've done so brilliantly and brilliantly well. And I, have no, I have no doubt whatsoever that it can be done again in the future. I understand the pressures on Hong Kong very well, but those pressures are not going to become less because suddenly the area of Hong Kong loses confidence in itself. Let me finish. What happens here in Hong Kong will be judged, is being judged by a watching world. For it will tell us whether the rise and rise of Xi Jinping is taking us forward to a new modern China or back to an old one. It will tell us too whether that extraordinary spirit of Hong Kong that has made success out of all sorts of adversity for more than 150 years will continue undiminished and continue to deliver that for this area and for the people who live here. Thank you very much. Thank you sincerely, Paddy. So we'll, we'll take questions, but um, if I could um, kick things off by um, going
going to your, your original broad point on the rise of China. Um, it was Emily. Yeah, absolutely. It will come to Emily. But so, Paddy, if I could just um, have you any optimism then that when you talk about re this return to the old China, that in fact it might just be a slower transition than we anticipated, or do you really think that we are doing something of a, of a U turn in terms of China's development? I don't know. Do you? I mean, look, you look at those 3,000 words, um, which was uh, brought into the Constitution of the Congress, there's quite a lot of contradictory stuff in there. Um, so people will naturally pick out this sentence and say that shows a moving in one direction. I don't know yet. I do know this, that if China wants genuinely to pursue a uh, soft power of the world, and I think that is something they want to do, it's not going to be helped by taking a very hard line in Hong Kong. Absolutely. I know why, I mean, you know, you can understand why some of the hardliners, what they might be thinking, um, this is uh, pour encourager les autres. Uh, it's there to uh, send certain messages out to I don't know, Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan. I understand that. Um, but Hong Kong, I think, can be uniquely valuable to China, and it would be foolish uh, for that to be wrecked. I mean, it can be uniquely valuable because of its rule of law status, because it could have the potential to become an area for mediation, um, because it offers something very special, which otherwise China wouldn't have. Now, it offers something special to the world. I happen to think that one country, two system is a very good model for re resolving other uh, issues elsewhere. So this is a very valuable thing. It's hybrid. It's difficult to understand. Perhaps it's especially difficult to understand for some in Beijing who don't have a detailed experience of the culture of democracy and what it means, who doesn't quite understand the fragilities of the system, which they sometimes um, uh, intrude into, perhaps without as much thought as they should. So I, I honestly don't believe we know the answer to your question yet, and uh, I hope not. Chinese are famous for taking a long view. Um, I think people in Beijing must understand that the idea that you can have a highly liberalized economy and a society that returns to the kind of central control and repressive structures of Mao Tse, the era of Mao Zedong, that is, it's impossible for that to last, it seems to me, impossible. I've heard of one country, two systems raised in the context of other current political debates. Yes. Which, yes, like your home and mine. Oh, but we, we, we'll not, we will not. One country, two systems. I just wish, yes. I'd that. It's a good idea, though, isn't it? Um, okay, so questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Emily Lau, and uh, welcome to Hong Kong, Paddy. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for reminding us uh, what a British Prime Minister said, that Hong Kong will never walk alone. And I hope all British Prime Ministers and members of Parliament will always remember this. And although you've just been here for two and a half days, I guess you are aware that Hong Kong people are very jittery. Some of them are, just like I was telling the, my friend sitting next to me, that uh, it's like in the 80s and 90s, some people want to leave because they feel that their future is not secure. So. Will you, will Britain help the Hong Kong people who feel very nervous? Will you throw a lifeline to the Hong Kong people? They say those who hold BNO passports should be given the right of abode in the UK so that they can feel that they have a home to go to if things go desperately wrong here. So Paddy, what do you and your fellow members of parliament think? Will you like to walk with the Hong Kong people and make us feel that we, our future is secure, whether it's here in Hong Kong or in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Well, Emily, it was Emily, I remember we were talking about British, uh, the BNO passports, and she once said to me, I know what BNO stands for. It stands for Britain Says No. <laughs> um, which I, I have to say is rather the mood of my country um, at the moment, I'm sorry to say. Um, uh, extending your question a bit, Emily, if I may, we're going to set up this parliamentary system called Hong Kong Watch. Um, and in case anybody thinks this is all about sort of taking a microscope up and, and deciding from afar, that, that reading the runes of every little battle that takes place in Hong Kong, large or small, it's not just directed um, at one side of the joint agreement. It's there to act as a prod for the British government too. And the British government is now 
obsessed with Brexit, trying to build trade deals. It's a huge plum for the British to have a trade deal with China. Um, we must ensure that Britain fulfills its legal and duty of honour to, to Hong Kong, and, that, and we will be doing that. Um, it will look at both sides, the actions of both sides, and it will act as a whistleblower. Uh, we'll wait to see what happens after that. On VNOs, Emily, you'll not be surprised to know uh, that I would favour very strongly the BNO being extended to right of abode if it is the case that the conditions in Hong Kong are created by whatever force that enables those who hold the BNO passport to feel so vulnerable they can't live here any longer. And I think as a, as a backstop assurance, um, that should be provided. How many BNO passports are present? I'm told there's about 15,000. There are many other BNO passport holders uh, who have allowed that to lapse. It is a fact that they can apply to have that reinstated. At the moment, the SAR passport is probably a better travel document than a BNO to you, so you, you understand that. But I think there is a strong case um, to say that uh, uh, it's there. I don't say we should do it now, but if it is the case that those who have BNO passports feel so vulnerable they can't live here any longer, and that is proven to be a case, then I think Britain should certainly be prepared to be to show, to show generosity in that matter. I have to tell you rather bleakly that if Paddy Ashdown, leader of the nearly destruct, des destroyed Liberal Democrats, take that, take that view, it probably isn't necessarily what, uh, it going to be the case that it will prevail against the wider move of the country, which, to put it mildly, is not in favour of immigration of any sort, sadly. Okay, next question, please, is at the back. Lord Ashdown, thank you very much for your speech. The original uh, title uh, was the, Th the yes. Thucydides Trap. Uh, now, I haven't read the history of the Peloponnesian War. I assume that's uh, uh, to what your, your title referred. But uh, from what I know of that work, by the, the, the implication is somehow there that conflict between Athens and Sparta uh, in ancient Greece was inevitable. No, I don't think that is the implication. I mean, uh, this is not a title I chose. It was and chosen. May I just ask? Yeah, but I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. The conflict between China and the US is in some way inevitable. No. First of all, the Thucydides trap. I think it's a lovely title. Uh, and if, if it's an end of the question mark in your head, it's achieved its effect. Uh, it wasn't my title, it was the title invested on it by the FCC. But it's not bad. Uh, and I, I wish I'd come up with it. Um, what does it mean? Better ask them. No, that's not true. If you look at Thucydides, what Thucydides and Pericles and Athens were, and this was, a, this was a time when the primary facet of Athens' strength lay in its rule of law and its democracy. Now, the question is, how far can you take that? It was not predicting what you have suggested. Though, and I'm not making a prediction. Look, here's my case. If you look at the generation of great wars, you find that it nearly always comes down to, I mean, really great wars which have a global capacity to, or a capacity to become global, or very widespread. It's nearly always uh, clashes of two concepts of imperialism. Uh, and what you certainly saw in Europe as a prelude to this was the growth of mercantilist competition in Europe, and then accompanied by the projection of power accompanied by the amelioration of military budgets, so that what started off as mercantilist competition went through confrontation and ended in conflict. Now, I'm not a historical determinist, I'm not a Marxist, but it has to be said that those three ingredients now exist in this region. Now, that isn't to say that the pressures in the region cannot be handled, I think they perfectly can be, um, but this is the great growth area, it seems to me, for the world that there is a nation who has to come to terms with their new position in the world, the United States, which has changed, and that's uncomfortable for them, and there's a rising power. All of these things um, make ingredients which I think ought to cause us to be wary and alert. I wouldn't go further than that. Stand back, please. Thank you for a fantastic speech. My name is Paul Haswell. Um, China's rise uh, has been very much a financial success, and it feels like it's clung on to or re-embraced, in some cases, authoritarian structures on yeah. the basis that the people are getting rich, therefore don't worry too much about human rights. 
And it seems, in fact, that they're now starting to export that around the world. And indeed, I go so far to say that many in Hong Kong are embracing China and not really worrying about freedom of speech on the promise that they will get rich. So my question is, if the money runs out, and the money always runs out, what happens then? Well, I mean, we are sitting here, and, and as I, I use the word iconography, we are sort of looking at the signs and the tremors and wondering what on earth it means. There's a great story which I adore, um, which I'm going to tell you because you might as well have a bit of a laugh. Um, we, the, the, the last words, the last discussion, so it is said, between, uh, between Stalin and Churchill, uh, Yalta came first, then Potsdam, so Potsdam. I thought the story was apocryphal, um, but it's funny story, and I repeated it when I was in, I went to Moscow when I was in, um, in high representative in, 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 um, in Bosnia and saw Lazarov, uh, Lavrov, the, uh, the, the still um, Russian foreign minister, and I repeated it to him, and he said, every schoolboy in Russia knows the story. So here's the story. The last conversation, Churchill has now been removed, the election's taken place. I imagine the two of them sitting on a park bench, and Stalin said, Mr. I can't do the Russian accent, I'm sorry, Mr. Churchill, he said, um, of course, um, we have had the KGB, the KGB, working behind the scenes, bugging your rooms, putting beautiful women against your diplomats, looking in the waste paper baskets to define and discover what your positions in the two great congresses would be, and now they're all finished, and the world is signed and seemed and delivered, and there's no further discussion, and you're no longer British Prime Minister, will you do me a favour? And Churchill said, well, of course. And Stalin said, well, we've had one bit of paper that was recovered from the waste paper basket by one of our agents. And as a British, it's obviously British code, he said. And here, he said, will you tell me? Will you tell me for my own sake? Because you've had the best cryptologists and the best linguists in Russia working on it. Will you tell me what it means? And Churchill said, well, of course. And Stalin picked out the piece of paper, so smoothed it out on the table. And there written in Churchill's hand was the words, dead birds don't leave their nests. And Stalin said, dead birds don't leave the nests. What British, what is it? And Churchill said, you didn't see the piece of paper that Anthony Eden passed to me, which said, your fly buttons are undone. Uh, but the, reason, the reason I tell that story is because it's very easy to look at the things and think you know and get the wrong message. So I, I genuinely think, I, I don't think, look, it is the habit of dictators, the, the sort of, the, the bargain that dictators do with their people is always guys, give me your freedom and I'll give you riches. Or security, by the way. You give me your freedom and I'll give you security and riches. And it's very often that people will find that a congenial bargain to take in difficult times. But it never lasts. It never lasts. Look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, freedom is in that equation too. And I can understand how, given China's past and the difficulties of China's past, how this can be a seductive bargain at present. But my guess is that if China is like every other nation, the Chinese people are not different from every other, and I think that's the case, that bargain isn't going to last. There will be a moment, and I think you can begin to see it in the rising levels of dissent. By the way, one of the reasons I suspect that Xi Jinping has taken this hard line, um, that people are going to say, thank you very much for the prosperity, but we really want some freedom. You just can't live your life economically totally free and politically repressed. So my guess is that that internal contradiction will begin to be unraveled long before the money runs out. And in that sense, somebody said to me the other day, actually a representative of Beijing said to me, well, all this democracy stuff, you know, time's on our side. And I said to him, no, it's not, you know, time's on their side. Um, these people who are arguing for democracy, I mean, you, you, these young men and women, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a great, I'm great, admi great admirer of them, do I agree with everything they've done? Certainly not. I don't agree with everything that's been done by my own bloody Liberal Party, let alone uh, <laughs> others. But they, do, they are genuinely standing up, and for this I think they need much credit. They're genuinely standing up for one country, two systems. And my guess is that history is much more on their side in the long term than it is on those who would seek to crush that. Uh, I'm not saying who that is at the moment, but you may be able to guess. Questions from the floor? Doug? Mr. Ashdown, on the relations between China and the United States and, and the, 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 uh, the imminence of, uh, of a clash, um, do you think that China or the US is a greater threat to world peace? <laughs> uh, 
Um, the answer is, um, I, I, I think President Trump is, because of the irrationality. Um, I mean, look, does anybody launch out to go to war? Well, unless you're Adolf Hitler, the answer to that is no. Wars usually come about by accident. You get to a point. I mean, just remember that in, 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 in the First World War, it was started because the Kaiser couldn't pull the trains back. He wanted to, but the trains were already running on the German railway system, and we were at war. It was almost, and it was started with this minor event. What worries me about our world today is, is, is not that anybody is determined upon war. It is that I look around the world and I see so many piles of tinder, any one of which, by inadvertence, could be set alight, leading to a wider conflagration. In that sense, and for sorry, I hope you didn't come here to be cheered up. Bad luck if you did. Uh, in that sense, it does really quite remind me quite a lot of the period of 1912-1913. It isn't, and, and the problem about Mr. Trump is that he's so bloody unpredictable and blunders about. So that will Trump want to war? No, but you know, he's the kind of person who could certainly do something absent mindedly or inadvertently that leads to something that um, no one would have predicted. And it's that that worries me, the, 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 the position. I don't think China and the United States are marching to war. I don't think it's the, uh, inevitable. I just think it adds to the febrility, if that's a word, of the present age. Uh, and it creates another period of tension, another point of tension, and it means that um, yet another confrontation badly handled can lead to um, unbelievable things. Well, that's a question over here. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Trump's policy is profoundly bad for the United States. I mean, that they should have voluntarily abandoned the leadership of that multilateral space where so much of the world's business goes on seems to me to be an act of extraordinary folly. Hello, um, thank you for the speech. My name's Elisa. Um, just moving it to a different continent. Um, before the recent change of uh, leadership in Zimbabwe, it was rumored that they went to China to seek permission whether this would be possible. Now, my question is, is this a sign that uh, power is being given to China or is because of all their investments in Africa? Or is it that they are taking the power? Well, a bit of both, really. Um, if you are investing huge sums of money that China is in Africa, China will, that will give them a degree of, of influence over what goes on there. Uh, I mean, if this is remarkable and new to you, it certainly shouldn't be. It's absolutely the case during, for instance, the period of the British Empire. Uh, almost the same kind of thing happened. Um, so China is doing its... And, and, I, I genuinely do believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we should not regard this bold fact that China is extending mercantile power into political power and influence around the world, that they're projecting that power, that they're using it to protect their... Somebody came to me the other day and said, isn't it scandalous? Isn't it utterly scandalous? China is raping Africa. And I said, yes, and, and what do you think Britain did in the period of, um, of, of our rise to superpower status? It's what superpowers do. It's the way that you use that power that matters. So I don't think that China's desire to have a degree of influence in the area which provides a primary part of their raw materials is by itself an evil or bad thing. In fact, if it gets China engaged in those areas, and by and large, she's so far been engaged. Really, the first period of Chinese engagement in Africa was appallingly colonialist. But they soon learned their lesson, and in most cases, that's now being pursued with a much more gentle hand. Um, certainly their, their commitment to multilateral peacekeeping in Africa, where most of those 3,700 Chinese troops serving under the, um, under the blue helmet of the president across the world. Um, and most of those are in Africa. So I just think that's a natural effect of what's of the kind of world we're currently living in. But it's the way that China uses that power. Um, will she follow um, the use of, bro of brute military power? rather than economic power? Will she be a, a, a move towards, use her influence to create a, a rule-based world system or one dominated by naked power? These are the questions that, that matter. Not that they are engaged in the way that you described, it seems to be. Yep, just here. Uh, John Davis is my name. Can I switch to another continent and oh, say Lord. that if you were giving a speech in Canberra, what would you be saying? get involved in ASEAN, and they are, of course, but take it seriously. I mean, I think what you're beginning to see in the world now, and the sadness of is 
by the way, I, I hope you don't think it's too far off the question, question and I'm not sort of misusing it. I think the development of regional groupings is one of the natural consequences to the growth of globalized power. It's the way that you band together with others with whom you share a common interest in order to be able to give yourself a greater con control over a globalized system. And in that sense, Europe is a classic early example of that. And by the way, I mean, all that I see from Europe now, I think the danger moment of Europe has passed. Probably, it's not yet in home ground, but there are some question marks, but there's a tipping point that's been taking place in Europe in the last uh, round of elections where I think the European leaders have decided and the public has agreed that they should take refuge in the kind of world we're living in, in European solidarity rather than Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and isolationism. And that is the right reaction to the world in which they find themselves. And I think it's exactly the right reaction for Australia as well. So I would get strongly engaged within your regional structures, I think. Penny, we're running out of time. I just want to, given that you are a UK lawmaker, um, do you want to give a brief update on where you think the Brexit process is at <laughs> and, uh, uh, and how you think uh, it will play out over course? Brief, you think? As brief as possible. I mean, my country has done itself the most... I think this will go down in history as one of the most extraordinary examples of a country doing itself gross self-harm in full possession of its faculties. Um, and uh, I think we have the most dysfunctional, dystopian government I have ever known. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister has no authority. The government is, the cabinet is completely divided as to what kind of Brexit they want to have. Um, I mean, this government can't deliver on anything. You couldn't deliver the Sunday papers without a scrap. <laughs> um, Brexit, there are three so called barriers to Brexit. They are barriers. One is the money. I think they'll come to an agreement about that. I mean, you know, there'll be a bit of grey fuzziness at the edges, but I think that's going to be resolved. Two is the issue of European citizens living in Britain. I think that's within reach of solution. Three is Ireland, and I can't see how the hell you solve that at all, at all, at all. Uh, I mean, the only rational solution is two countries, one system. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and, and have, a, and have a, you know, an economic border down the Irish Sea. Um, but... You know, I think God must have given up his temporary membership of the Conservative Party because when she got that minority government, she reached out to the DUP. Can you imagine a more irresponsible thing than take... Somebody once said, can't remember who it was, never give power to the Ulsterman. It's dead wrong. I am an Ulsterman, by the way, so I can say that. And so you have the DUP now holding the government to ransom. And the one solution that might be possible is one which the DUP would walk out the door straight away. So that's a real problem. Look, I'll make you some predictions, and before you take them too seriously, do remember I am the bloke who, on, uh, as, the, uh, as the exit poll was announced on the night of the, 90, of the 2017 election, so what was it, 16 election, uh, said that if that is true, I will eat my hat uh, before the nation. And by the way, I have eaten five hats. <laughs> one chocolate, one marzipan, one shortbread, one in the shape of a Cornish pasty, and one very small hat, very small hat, I can tell you, on television on every occasion. So bear in mind, I'm not necessarily famous for making predictions. Although I did predict the 2000, the last election, I said she couldn't resist going. My view is, and this is a minority view, my view is that on balance, on balance, narrowly, I now think Brexit will not happen. Not because it could not be done, but because the government is too, um, is too, incapable to deliver it. Uh, the House of Commons will not vote for a hard Brexit. They will not vote for a throw ourselves over the cliff Brexit. They could vote for a soft Brexit, but the government is too incompetent and too divided to be able to deliver any kind of soft Brexit that I think will make sense. So I think that this government is so riven, so incapable, so dystopian, that there will be a possibility that sometime next year it will simply collapse in on itself. Um, I mean, maybe the wish is farther to the thought, but I have a suspicion that, let's say, in the dark days of the third week of February, we'll wake up, and the Ulsterman will last to March, and by Thursday, we'll look at this miserable, broken-back, diseased cur of a government, do quote me in the newspapers if you can, <laughs> and decide that they'd better be gone. So I think that sometime next year, we'll probably have an election, and if you do have an election, or something close to a sort of deadlock in the House of Commons, um, then 
you could get a referendum or an election, but either of those will be about, will be about essentially, will be about whether you continue, continue with Brexit. And by that time, the economic pain of an economy which is now declining while everybody else is growing, the lack of the funds to be able to invest in public services, with the National Health Service standing on the edge of, of very nearly collapse, um, and perhaps a serious flu epidemic. I mean, I just think that, um, that Britain will say, OK, we now understand what the pain of Brexit is, and please can we find our way back? So on balance, I think the government will go next year. I, I think this is actually the wish being father to the thought, but never mind, I still believe it. And I think probably, probably narrowly, in the end, Brexit won't happen. All right, well, we're on 2 p.m. Unless there are any final questions, uh, could you all please join me in thanking Lord Padiashian so much for coming to us here in the SEC. <laughs>